So I want to start with um, a land acknowledgement. Here, uh, the speakers, Lauren, uh, myself, and Henry, we're all in Essex County, and uh, we are in the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of the First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi peoples. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of our past as we continue to move forward in the spirit of reconciliation. And I once heard um, a really great Indigenous educator that spoke about the importance of starting a meeting with gratitude and hope. So that is how I like to start my meeting. So I'll start with a statement of gratitude that I'm, I'm ever grateful that we have this technology that connects us from across the province. Um, to get together and learn from one another. And I'm hopeful that, uh, that we can give you guys some, some interesting and exciting information. So, uh, so what you're here watching is the, uh, the interconference webinar series. This is the last in the series. So we're here on March 8th, the Healthy Soil, Clean Water. Uh, this is part of a partnership in Living Lab, um, EFAO and IFAO, um, OSN, everybody's done their, their conferences already and we're just last up as our Conservation Authority partners. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about um, water quality, the connection between healthy soil and water. And, uh, and you're gonna hear from myself, Katie Samler, Lauren Weller and Henry Janotter. So just, uh, I'm going to quickly allow Henry and Lauren to introduce themselves. I'm Katie Stamler. I'm the water quality scientist at the Essex Region Conservation Authority. Um, my background is in aquatic ecology. I've been working in agricultural systems for the entirety of, of my um, academic career. And I'm really excited to, to get to work here in my home. I'm from Windsor originally, and um, I'm, I'm back here doing connected to the space that I like to be connected to and working with, uh, with people who feed my soul. So uh, I'm gonna hand that over to Lauren to introduce herself and then to Henry. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Weller. I'm an environmental scientist. I have previous experience in mining and I am a passionate soil health, ad soil health advocate. Um, yeah, I work at ERCA uh, as the watershed data technician and part of my talk today is I'll be talking to you about the connection between soil health and water. Over to you, Henry. Okay, um, I'm Henry Donater and I'm the, uh, the farmer, I guess, of the uh, of the area. Um, I am basically uh, trying to, to uh, fulfill everybody's everybody's dreams. Uh, doesn't mean it always going to work. So <laughs> I farm about uh, 1,500 acres with my wife and my son. Um, we've always been uh, advocates of no-till and as many best management projects as we possibly can incorporate into the system. And uh, we, uh, we are now going to run with a Living Labs project, which you'll see that later on in the presentation. And that is hopefully is going to showcase what uh, the whole program is after. Awesome, thanks Henry. Uh, so we're gonna start out by talking about the Living Lab initiative and this is a federal, um, it's across the whole, the whole country and there are Living Labs in Atlantic Canada, Quebec, Ontario and the Eastern provinces. And the whole idea of Living Lab is to, to create that approach to agricultural innovation that brings farmers, scientists, and other partners together with that keyword co-developing, testing, monitoring these new practices and technologies in a real life context. Uh, so we at uh, the Essex Region Conservation Authority, Lower Thames and Upper Thames Conservation Authorities, we are part of the Ontario Living Lab. And when we look at the core principles of Living Lab, they're user-centered innovation. So the, the farmers are really key to that, as well as our other agricultural partners, uh, working in that partnership, getting together in the places where the work is happening um, and, and bringing together what I find is really cool is that everybody's got a different skill set. So we've got farmers, we've got scientists, we've got communicators, social scientists, economic uh, economists coming together to, to really try to figure out what we're doing and, and how, uh, what the impact of that is and how we can make things uh, even better. And then again, you know, working in that, that real life context. And then I also pulled uh, these words out here. These are sort of the, the key higher level things that Living Lab is looking at. They're looking at innovation and what the effects are on biodiversity, how we can adapt for climate change, looking at impacts for water quality and how we can improve water quality, soil health, uh, looking at crop health and productivity. 
and that knowledge transfer piece, which is what we're, we're doing here and making sure that we're communicating all the things that we're doing. These are all of the partners that are involved in Living Lab. So it's got a great um, connection to a lot of different organizations and there is a crossover with a few other projects that we're gonna talk about as well. These are the, uh, the on-farm collaborator or the, the farmer, Ontario farmer collaborators that are testing our innovations for Living Lab. We have uh, Greg Vermeesh and uh, Brett Israel looking at uh, relay and double cropping um, small grains and soybeans and uh, Ken Lang, who does no-till organic farming and potatoes, Mike Groot, who's looking at rotational grazing and annual cover cropping and, um, or annual cropping, and uh, Woody Van Arkel, who looks at perennial cover crops. And of course, we have Henry Donatter with us today, whose uh, message to us is, is that, um, you know, we have to be considering water quality when we're doing our farming practices as well. So the other related program to Living Lab is a program called On Farm that some of you may have heard about as well, and that is an Ontario program that uh, IRCA, the Essex region, Lower Thames and Upper Thames are all part of, as well as Maitland Valley Conservation Authority and the Asable Bayfield Conservation Authority and the Soil Resources Group. And the, the reason that the, these two um, really overlap at their in their core and their pillars where they're both looking at water quality at soil health and engaging and, and getting those messages out. Um, so there's a lot of overlap and crossover and for us as well at the conservation authorities the programs happen in the same watersheds and we work with the same farmers so when we when we hear from henry you're going to hear about his edge of field sites that are both um you know it's, it doesn't matter you know to us or to him whether that's an on-farm site or a living lab site because really we're you know we're monitoring the farming practices and the best management practices that henry is employing so that we can better understand how soils and nutrients and other things leave the farm and enter our water courses. So that's how the two programs go together. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren here. She's going to talk to us a little bit more about that soil health and water interface and, and how that all goes together. Thank you, Katie. So I think as farmers, as researchers and as citizens alike, we're all way too aware that we're facing a multitude of challenges associated with soil degradation and erosion. And this includes the inc increased nutrient runoff, erosion of topsoils and desertification, all of which not only impact our food security, but also biodiversity. So what does this, oh, can you, can, you, can you give me the next slide? Sorry, I try to click it over myself. <laughs> so ultimately what that leads to is eutrophication of the of the great lakes and this is a classic example so what is eutrophication well eutrophication is a buildup of nutrients especially nitrogen and phosphorus in our waters and this leads to events such as hog such as harmful algal blooms and these are seen in lake claire and saint erie most summers so if you live along um here in windsor essex we regularly get um Warnings from our municipalities saying that our beaches are unsafe to swim in, this impacts fisheries, this impacts our, our water source protection for our drinking water, and so harmful algal blooms are a real problem here in the Great Lakes. Can we have the next slide, Katie? So how does soil health lead to algal blooms? Well, generally speaking, we, this is the process of eutrophication. So this is, a, this is an example of a non-point source of eutrophication. In the past, we used to look at um, our point sources. Those were our, um, our water pollution, our treatment plants, our sewage. We had a lot of raw sewage running into the lakes and it caused eutrophication. In the 70s and the 80s, a lot of that was cleaned up. And then slowly over the last decade or so, we've seen that eutrophication has returned to the Great Lakes. And this is mainly as a result of these non-point sources. And they're a little bit trickier to, to, um, to tackle, which is why we're doing all the research we're doing now. So what happens? Generally speaking, you have fertilizer from agricultural fields, potentially from greenhouses, potentially from lawns. Um, it runs off the fields into our water courses, maybe into our drainage ditches, maybe into our stormwater, or it leaches through our fields and comes out of tile drains and makes its way into our, our rivers or our Great Lakes. And this, uh, be because they're so, because this uh, fertilizer is running off into the water, what happens is the water becomes really full of nutrients. And so a whole lot of algae grows. And often the algae that's growing is this harmful type of algae that creates all kinds of um, 
byproducts, toxins. So you've got cytotoxins. And in addition to actually making the water toxic itself, it's also blocking out the sunlight. And so it's stopping other more maybe beneficial algae and um, other species from being able to photosynthesize and produce in our lake. And so the algae, we, we have an overproduction of this harmful algae. It causes our fish to self suffocate, then the algae dies, and the whole process starts again, releasing nutrients back into the water. So that is the link between how fertilizer runs off into the lake. And so that's essentially what we're trying to stop. But how do we go about that? Katie, if you could turn the next one. So, so that is the problem. But in trying to stop nutrients reaching the lake, we actually also have a wonderful opportunity. And this is where soil science, freshwater ecology, and restoration ecology um, interact. And so we have this opportunity to revitalize our freshwater systems, we can preserve soils, and we can increase biodiversity if we improve the functioning of our agroecosystems. Next slide. So the way that we do that is through agricultural conservation measures. And these are the kind of things that we're testing in our living labs and our on-farm programs. So what is an agricultural conservation measure? Well, it's a conservation action taken at the farm scale. And the idea is that you want to maintain agricultural production, therefore ensuring food security, but at the same time, reduce soil and nutrient runoff from our fields. And the idea is that at the bottom of our pyramid here is we have soil health. So soil health is the basis of anything else that we do on farms in order to control water within fields, below fields, or in the riparian. And so that's really the idea is that if we have healthy soils, it makes everything else that we do in terms of like any kind of um, reduction structures for erosion, anything we're planting in terms of cover crops and anything we're planting in, in the riparian zone are more effective if the soils in the field are in fact healthy. Next slide. So how do we, how do we know if our soils are healthy? Well, one of the best indicators of soil health is carbon. And so if we promote practices that increase carbon in our soils, we're going to create healthier soils. But how does this actually lead to cleaner water? Well, carbon in soils plays a major role in both binding and modulating nutrients. And so carbon is actually um, what, what, what keeps nutrients in soils or causes them to be released. And so what we want to do is we want to build as much organic matter in soils as we possibly can, therefore increasing the amount of carbon in soils. And the idea is that that'll not only absorb excess water and hold water in fields, but it'll also assist in terms of um, what nutrients are released and what nutrients are retained within our fields. Next slide, Katie. Okay, so looking here at Ontario, you can see um, this is a bit of an outdated map. The data is from 2011, but it's pretty clear that at least in Ontario, we have an unsustainable rate of soil organic matter loss. And so this is carbon leaving our fields and not coming back. This can be through um, runoff. It can just be through um, if you're growing crops in the field every year and there's no organic matter or residue being returned, you're essentially slowly breaking down the amount of organic matter that's in that field. Next slide, Katie. And so why, why is this important? Well, I've kind of mentioned again that the, um, that the carbon and the organic matter, they modulate and they release nutrients, but it's more than that. Organic matter also feel, feeds the soil itself. So if we have mineral fertilizers in the fields, they can do some of the job of organic matter in the sense that they can feed the plant. But if you don't have organic matter in your soil, what you're not feeding is your biology. So these are all the microorganisms that are taking, that are doing nutrient cycling within fields. And this is where the modulation of, of, of nutrients leaving the fields becomes important. So if you have organic carbon, or in this case, organic matter and mineral fertilizers within your soil, as opposed to just mineral fertilizers, you're going to have more of an ecosystem within the soil that's holding on to nutrients and not letting them run off. Next slide. So what do these practices look like that build organic matter? Well, here in um, Windsor, Essex, these are some ones that are currently being undertaken. The main one, because of our heavy clay soils here, is tillage. And so the main conservation measure practiced by most of our conservation farmers here in this little, in Essex, is um, conservation tillage or no tillage. We also have uh, cover crops such as drill, such as a drill radish, which is pictured here. A drill radish is useful because it can actually get deep down into the soil and it can pull up nutrients and bring them to the surface. We have intercropping and then we have animals in the rotation. Next slide. Um, 
something that would be useful but is not currently um, being undertaken in Essex is something called a two-stage ditch. And the idea is here is that you actually create a much larger buffer that not only stops the stream from flooding, but also is able to, you've got lots of vegetation on the sides. And so that vegetation is able to trap and treat nutrients running off the field before it actually reaches the drains. Uh, next slide. Um, an option that's done in other places in the world is agroforestry. This is where you combine um, productive food systems such as corn with non-productive um, forests, or in some cases, some people also do maybe nuts or any kind like a crop that can be in a in, in a in a long-lasting tree. But the idea is to have as many different types of plant within the system, and some of which are harvested and some of which are not. Uh, next slide. Um, this is an example from my home in South Africa. This is uh, regenerative grazing. And the idea here is that the farmers would um, try to simulate the natural grazing from big herbivores, which would have been indigenous to the area, as long as the natural fire cycle. A lot of farmers are nervous to um, introduce fire into their their uh, farm out here because it's really dry. And the idea of a forest fire seems scary, but funny enough, what happens on the right is what happens when you don't have enough burning and when you don't rotate your animals in like in, in the same way that the herds would naturally move across the land. Okay, uh, next slide please. And then this is my favorite um, example of great things that are being done on the technology front in terms of um, agricultural conservation. This is from further south in the US. Uh, this is a perennial wheat species. So the idea is you plant it once and you harvest it for multiple years. Um, it has really long roots, so it's able to withstand drought conditions, it's able to draw nutrients from deeper down in the soil and bring them up to the surface. And as I said, you, you're not planting every year, so you've already got a cover crop in for the entire winter, and you're able to not access nutrients and withstand droughts that are more shallow rooted. Um, if you look on the right hand side, you can see how shallow the uh, the regular roots of, of wheat are. So these are just some of the things that people are working on. We're looking at ways to kind of in just increase complexity with systems. And that's really always the goal with any kind of conservation measure. If you can increase the complexity, if you can increase, if you can keep roots in the soil as long as possible, that's how we build soil organic matter and that's how we build soil organic carbon. Um, and I think that is the end of my slides. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so, you know, using that information and, and having that understanding that, um, you know, people like Lauren, Lauren just finished her, her master's degree working on soil organic carbon, you know, building that, that knowledge base and understanding of how our farming practices um, have an impact on our local environment and on our water quality is super important. So how do we, as the conservation authorities and as these farm partners, how are we looking at that now through both the Living Lab and On Farm program? And uh, Patrick Candyside uh, made this really awesome graphic using a, you know, a word cloud of important words that we look at. And we've got weather and sampling and BMPs and cover crops and tillage practices. And these are all of the things that, you know, come together in these projects. So um, we look at the, the living lab sites, as I said, they're across the province. And we're going to talk um, at this point about how we monitor um, and measure these different practices. So there, we talk about edge of field sites. So there's uh, edge of field sites in Quebec and in um, the Atlantic Living Lab in Ontario on Henry's Fields and in the Eastern Prairies. And in the, uh, the on-farm program, we have eight cooperators who are doing edge of field research. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of what edge of field research looks like if you're uh, not sure yet. Uh, and then and we drill down into the watershed that we work in is the Weigel watershed in Essex region where Henry is. So uh, this is his living lab site is down here where we monitor water that's coming off of the field and through his tiles. And then his uh, on-farm site is a little further upstream in the, the watershed, but they're both in that same watershed. So we can monitor uh, the farming practices there. And this just gives you an idea too of, of what uh, Essex County looks like. Uh, so as conservation authorities, the roles that we play in these two programs, it's our job to, to monitor the water quality in the watershed, as well as at the edge of the field. We also conduct uh, voluntary land management surveys with willing farmers so that we can uh, gather up the information about you know, what crops did they use and when did they plant them and what did they put on them so that we can better understand uh, the water quality in the entire watershed. 
um, and then we work with the existing um, external consortium to deliver education materials. Uh, so, you know, what, you know, we, we heard from Lauren about, you know, how soil and water go together. And then, you know, when we think about what does that look like on the ground? So these are mostly images from uh, from Henry's Field here. So that, that gives you, you know, we've all seen water coming off of a field or sitting on a field. And that's what we want to measure is, is how it comes off the field. So we've got these, um, these weirs that are placed here. So the water runs over it. And what that allows us to do here uh, you know, we know it's designed in a very specific way uh, by a partner who's uh, who knows these things much better than I do, but it's designed in such a way that we're able to calculate the amount of water that comes over. And then we take samples and that tells us what's in the water. So we can take that, that, um, that water chemistry analysis and the water volume, and that'll tell us the total amount of nutrients and sediment that's leaving the field. The other piece that, that we're interested in monitoring is tile drains. So we know that the tiles um, you know, carry a lot of this stuff as well. In Essex, it's a little bit challenging to monitor tile drains because we have, because our landscape is so flat, we have individual laterals that just go straight out into the ditch. So it makes it a lot harder for us to monitor that tile flow. And this is a cool photo uh, Craig Irwin uh, took. Um, there's there's actually a, a great blue heron hanging out here, seeing if he might catch any fish or little aquatic bugs hanging out on the field. So for these for these programs, what are we collecting? And, and ultimately, we're working with uh, watershed modelers. Uh, we've got Dr. Wen Han Yang, who's with us today, um, and and we collect up that data for folks like that to implement into mathematical models, um, to look at the whole watershed and the inputs that go into it. And then they can model different types of practices and say, well, what if we did this kind of BMP or what if we tried this here? And then we can start to see, um, you know, how we might be able to change water quality in those watersheds. But in order to build that model, we have to have a lot of data to, to put into it over many years. So we, you know, we have climate data. So we've got a weather station in the watershed. We need to know water quality and quantity. So we need to know how much water is moving through it. We need to know what the water chemistry looks like. Uh, we have lots of uh, GIS type work that happens. So that's geographical information systems. So we look at our watershed boundary, our field boundaries, our stream boundaries, our uh, the digital elevation. So we need in Essex, the fall is is very small. So those DEMs are are quite flat. But it's really important to have that understanding of where water moves on the landscape, um, and we need to know what that land cover is. And we get that through our, those land management surveys where we sit down with the farmers and we ask them, you know, what did you do year over year? Which crops did you plant? Um, how, did you, how did you leave your residue? Did you, you know, clean it completely out? Did you mulberry plow it? Did you conservation till all of that information? And we use all of that data together to help us understand what agricultural practices are being implemented on the landscape and how they can affect water quality. So what that looks like at the watershed scale, this is an image from um, Upper Thames um, at their site in Medway Creek. So they've got their, we've got these ISCO auto samplers. So you might hear us uh, speak about ISCOs off and on if you follow us on Twitter. Uh, these are um, automated samplers. So the, there's a hose out in the, the water course. And when it rains, we watch the hydrograph. So that's what this graph is here is a hydrograph. And it shows you the water level. So you'd see, you know, maybe it rained a little bit here. So the water level came up and then it came down and then we had a big rain event, event. So the water level comes way up and way back down again. And what we want to monitor um, so that we have an understanding of what's going on with water quality, we look at those background levels. So before it rained and we're taking routine samples. And then we want to catch um, a sample somewhere on what we call the rising limb. So as the water level is coming up, so that's picking, starting to pick up material off the, the landscape, then we want to try to capture something at the peak and something on the falling limb as things are coming down. I don't think we have a photo of this, but um, you'll see in the water samples, if you line them up, that you have, you know, a relatively clear water sample, and then you'll see it become um, muddier and muddier as you've got more and more sediment in it as you're coming up to the peak, and then you'll see it clear out again. So we want to try to capture it in those discrete times. So we have an understanding of how water quality changes through the duration of a rain event. 
some of the things that we've been able to, to learn and change through this is, you know, we've improved our ways that we monitor flow. Flow is a really complicated thing to measure. So actually understanding how much water moves through the actual volume of water moving through is really hard. It requires some really detailed data and, you know, equipment that fails on you and all sorts of things. So, you know, we've been able to invest through these programs in highly sensitive equipment that helps us understand those high flows when water is too dangerous for us to typically go in and take a, a weighting measurement. So this is a cool schematic that one of our partners sent us that gives you an idea of, of what one of our sampling sheds might look like. Uh, so this would be, you know, a weather station. We've got our tile flow coming out here. And in the, this lucky situation, these folks are able to tap into a header drain. Uh, so they're able to monitor their, um, their tile flow. And then they've also got their surface flow coming off through an overland flume and again into one of our ISCO auto samplers. And then our technicians go out and they collect the bottles um, after the rain is done. So just wanted to, to give you an idea of, you know, the difference and how these things can look. This is our edge of field site. And uh, because of you know, the agreements that we have, you know, this is a, a farm that Henry farms, but he rents this land. So the, the landowner doesn't want there to be a permanent structure there. So when it rains, we have to bring our totes out with our automated samplers in it uh, to capture that versus something really lovely like this, a nice wooden shed that can sit out on, on somebody's farm. Uh, you know, we've got Rubbermaid bins, we've got stainless steel, um, containers. So there's lots of different ways that that can end up looking in the field. And uh, one of our partners wanted to make sure that we talked about that we sample all year round. So and it and it is challenging, you know, sometimes we all have sleds in our vehicles so that we can uh, pull our water samples on sleds um, and trying to capture that snow melt is, is quite challenging as well. This is an example from Upper Thames, and I'm going to speak about it, um, you know, really high level because it's it's not something that I'm intimately familiar with. But our partners from Upper Thames are here, and they can speak to it in more detail, um, you know, when we're when we're chatting later on. So in the in the Medway, they've got um, a site where they're able to have separate catchments in a single field, and on one of those catchments, they've got cover crop, and on the other cover the other section, they've left it bare. And they've, they've got their, their weirs set up in the field so that they can monitor exactly what's coming off of that field. And you can see from their water samples, just from a photo alone, that their water samples are quite clear where they have cover crop and uh, very full of sediment where they don't have, have cover crop. So just an image to show you uh, what those two fields look like. And then uh, just some very preliminary data from them that shows you that the water quality coming off of the cover crop side is better. It has less sediment, um, the total phosphorus is lower, and the, um, uh, the soluble phosphorus is similar. So what do we face as, as the you know, conservation authority staff uh, who are out there physically taking the, the samples and successes and challenges that we have? Uh, you know, relationships with our farmers and growers to solve to solve this common uh, challenge. That's a real win, you know, and these are existing relationships that we've that we have already had that we've been fostering that we get to continue uh, to grow. And we get to work with each other, which is really cool because, you know, there, we, there's an equivalent to me at every other conservation authority. So I get to connect with those other people that are doing that same work and learn from them because, you know, maybe they've been doing this a lot longer than I have and they've, and they've got some tips and tricks up their sleeves. Um, and just that, that really valuable information of how nutrients move off the land. And of course the challenges, you know, weather and planning, we have to be ready to quickly adapt. And, uh, you know, Henry's gonna speak about how the weather impacts his plans and that impacts our plans. Um, and, you know, there's equipment failures and troubleshooting. There's almost never can you go out and say, I had a perfect day in the field and all the equipment worked exactly the way it was supposed to. Um, but you roll with it because that's the way it is and, um, and and we try our best. And of course, we had COVID-19 restrictions as anybody else. We did continue sampling, so we weren't restricted in our ability to go out, but we were restricted in what we could collect because we couldn't be close to one another. So that did definitely change how we did things. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Henry and let him tell you his story. Um, and we prepared Henry's slides, but it is Henry's story. So um, Henry, take it away. Okay, thanks, Katie. So uh, I see that was one of my better pictures. I must have I must have got a haircut the day before, so I actually didn't have long, shaggy hair. Uh, but anyway, this is a this is a picture of our um, 
wheat uh, wheat stubble field from last uh, last summer. As you can see, it's a, a lovely lime green. Um, it's been sprayed down with uh, with Liberty to burn off all the uh, all the wheat growth and any weed growth. And that little dust cloud cloud in the back corner is uh, is our air seeder uh, planting buckwheat. So buckwheat is uh, my preferred crop uh, as I. Uh, cover crop and we're actually trying to take it to harvest for uh, different reasons. Uh, we like the fact that it's a pollinator friendly crop. Uh, it's just another angle uh, on trying to make uh, cover crops work. Uh, we, uh, we had a lot of plans for this field, but uh, the only thing we did, we managed to plant buckwheat and ended up being a, a poor crop and we did not harvest it. We just had to leave it. Um, it will be, uh, it will be desiccated down in the in the spring, and uh, we'll have to tune up the fertilizer, and it will be a corn crop. Corn does do really well after buckwheat, and the one thing about buckwheat, uh, once you have it, you have it forever. So you have to make sure you have a crop to uh, not that you can spray it to knock it down. So, okay, what's the next slide? All right. So this is this is Weigel Creek, and uh, like uh, Katie said, Weigel Creek is by far mostly a roadside uh, municipal drain and this is this picture here on the right has been taken off of a bridge it's approximately 25 feet from the bridge to the uh, water flowing and water is actually at a low level at this picture but it can come up halfway that bank in a rain event and we are about two-thirds of the way down the creek because there's still another third before we hit the lake Okay, so next. So this is this is our uh, our starting point. This is what really started this all off. Started off for me. Uh, Katie did, took these samples. Uh, on the top, you'll see there's a uh, a field uh, that looks pretty barren on the right and green on the left, uh, just like everybody else. One field is uh, it's got a cover crop on it, and the other other side has nothing. And this is a cover crop after wheat. We sprayed that wheat field faithfully about three times during the summer to make sure there was absolutely no growth so that uh, whatever was coming off was uh, pure, purely water and soil. And you can see from the water samples that we've got um, soil, soil sediment, and from the testing, we do have phosphate and that coming off the, uh, the field. All right, okay. so. That started this whole project here. This is uh, this is last year. We were putting uh, the uh, loggers in in the uh, in the soybean field. Um, you can see the flume uh, or the, on the left of the uh, the picture there. And then on the bottom, you can see what uh, what a rain event. Like really, what happens? So okay, June twenty seventh, we had a rain event. Eight o'clock in the morning, we're out there. And okay, we've got a little bit of water backing up, and uh, there's a little trickle over the uh, over the notch. Uh, by seven seven o'clock, seven p.m., we've had we're at four inches of rain, and we've got a lot of water coming over the notch. And uh, another picture of the uh, actual rainfall. We have had we had a rain gauge out there, so we could see what was going on. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of water sitting in that uh, swell. Uh, and you might say, well, you, you wouldn't like that. Well, I didn't like it, but uh, it was all gone in 24 hours. It didn't, it really didn't affect the crop that much, but it just basically was a, a visual eye opener. What four inches of rain looks like on that particular field. Now this particular field has uh, five uh, swells in it. We're monitoring three. They are man-made. They were made about 40 years ago by, uh, by Evan Grant. He's the one that had decided that we needed surface drains. The field is tiled, um, basically uh, systematically. Uh, this one does have some tiles going into some mains and uh, we were able to, uh, to kind of get all that, that lined up. But the biggest thing is the surface water goes under the road and drops into the uh, Weigel Creek. And then Weigel Creek is monitored pretty uh, pretty thoroughly all the way along uh, by by IRCA and uh, Ag Canada to uh, to see what's going on. Okay, let's next. So there again, you can see this is the field that we're working on on the left. 
with a red square around it. You can see the three different uh, swells that have been that have been carved in, and uh, you can kind of see the flow of where there are tiles coming um, underneath the the center flume. And uh, again, um, they're not uh, not uh, put out the exact you know nice and neat and square. They're just all over the place. Uh, the field is well drained. And to get your perspective of size, this was a 50 acre farm at one time. Now it's all one field and with the uh, lot in the upper corner taken off where there's a, a residence. And again, on the right is, a, is a, another picture of, uh, of our notch uh, put in there. And we do have uh, stones on all the spillways to try and control erosion. And so we like we don't have great big rills of gouges in the uh, in the fields. Uh, everything is drains off fairly reasonably slow, and uh, and we leave the soil where it belongs. Okay. So again, you can see this is a uh, on the left is uh, is before we put the uh, the weeders in, and you can see the stones not and somebody contributed some garbage to the uh, to the spillway, which is a pretty common problem. Uh, in the county. And uh, we've got a little bit of water tracking uh, movement, but of course, in this case here, there is no, uh, there is virtually no cover. And the same as on the right, we've got water sitting there, but uh, there is very little cover, but the, uh, the water quality is relatively clean. Okay, next. Okay, so that, that, that was the on-farm site, like our, with field edge monitoring. Now that started at this looking into the living lab site. So this red square, which is three fields, this is our living lab site. Uh, it is <clears throat> approximately 165 acres split up into three fields. The whole idea was to try and, and do a proper crop rotation and uh, put this together. Um, Pat and Sonia came out and put monitor system systems in to monitor the water quality, uh, which you can see in the upper right hand is one of the stations. We've uh, put uh, stainless steel berms around, put uh, different troughs in there to try and collect the water, try and get a, a good a picture as possible. And the, all three sites have a main monitoring system and a surface monitoring system. Uh, the uh, the big field uh, was is a is a cornfield and uh, the field on the south there, which is, uh, is the biggest field is a, uh, that was a wheat field uh, last summer and that's going to be a cornfield next year. And then the smaller field, which is 35 acres was soybeans and is now planted in wheat. So the whole idea is to try and get the rotation going. Cornfields will become bean fields, wheat fields become cornfields and Soybeans and wheat, they, they, they follow each other. And what we're gonna try and maintain is try and utilize as many best management practices as we can to try and work towards soil health and try to stick with a 4R strategy. So the, uh, the 35 acre bean and soybean field has been planted in wheat. Uh, first problem, it looks terrible. Uh, we've, we're suffering hey, from some now. kind of a loss that we, we can't seem to get a, uh, uh, a greenness or green color. I'm hoping that it will survive and that it'll be a worthwhile crop because I really want to come in there and plant buckwheat in that field. That buckwheat would have been a normal uh, strategy for us. Uh, and, you know, as Lauren had talked about, uh, you know, carbon is important. Uh, we've tried different things to enhance the crop, but we also want to try and leave as much organic material in the field as possible. So contrary to uh, my equipment operator's uh, desire, we will probably no-till buckwheat uh, into shredded straw. Uh, and as in, in the last couple of years, we've taken the straw right off, gotten it out of the picture, and just to make it a lot simpler uh, for growing buckwheat and faster emergence. But if we can get, we think we can get in there and get it planted with the, with the air seeder, it will put it in the ground. So we can help build up that, uh, that carbon, carbon in the soil. And now the soybean field, 
The soybeans will go in the corn stalks, I'm sorry, in the larger field to the, on the right-hand side. So the right-hand side, Katie. Okay, that one. So that was corn last year, uh, did very well. And we will come in and no-till um, soybeans in between the rows. Now, one thing that I probably haven't told you is everything's, our whole system is based on 20 inch rows. Corn's planted in 20 inch rows, soybeans in 20 inch rows. Now wheat still broadcasts, but that is the, the biggest uh, thing. We have to make it work so that we can move over 10 inches and plant the next crop, especially in the corn soybean rotation. Uh, that seems to, it has worked very well. Uh, we have lots of uh, documentation where it's definitely a favorable uh, favorable way to do, uh, do the cropping systems. The only problem is 20 inch corn rows can be a bit of a pain in the ass. Uh, they, because uh, we need to be uh, right on as far as accuracy of driving and there's very little room for, uh, for error. Now, GPS has definitely helped all that, which makes it great. We can get things lined up, but when you have to start going through 20 inch corn that is six feet tall and side dressed nitrogen, because that's a procedure that uh, we've kind of uh, developed and that is, that is working, we're wide dropping uh, the nitrogen right on the corn stalks. Uh, yeah, I do get a lot of comments from my, uh, my driver there. And by the way, my driver is my son, so he definitely uh, voices his opinion when things aren't going right. Now the wheat, uh, the wheat field in the bottom, that, that was a great wheat field this year. Uh, we did an extensive soil test, uh, required 100 and, 150 ton of lime to be put on it. So we did all that. Uh, we did incorporate a little bit. Uh, we had to do that. But again, we did not take the straw off. All that carbon is still in the field. It's uh, pretty well dissolved now. The uh, microbes have eaten it up. So uh, it is uh, it is disappearing. So we will need to, the plan was to uh, strip till in the fertilizer, but uh, mother nature decided that we should not do that. So now it's gonna be a spring project. So then again, there's, again, we have to try and keep, we wanna try uh, go with it with a rotation as much as possible and uh, and keep uh, keep things in, in line so that we have a realistic view what a three crop rotation is doing uh, you know if we're if we're constantly just planting soybeans year after year after year uh, and putting fertilizer down um, again how we put it down is not not doing it for me it's not really giving me a, a bit a, a good picture. Now, as a sidetrack moment, if you I mean, look at the uh, the picture at the right, you'll see a field there uh, that's don't no, back up. Okay, right there, that field that that is a neighbor's field that is freshly tiled, and that is seems to be the new way of tiling in Essex County. You can see there's a main right down the middle, and all the laterals go off of it, and they're actually all on angles to be more efficient. That field is tiled at, at approximately 50 feet. Uh, that does go into one of the tributaries of Weigel Creek. So again, uh, the, that's, not, uh, that's not the normal. Normally everybody just tiles, just backs up the ditch, drops a, a four inch down and pulls into the field and that field's tiled. And that's the way uh, most of uh, my field is tiled but there were a couple of mains put in and we are fortunate to get, get onto those mains. So the next picture there, uh, Katie. So this is the uh, water sampling station that uh, Pat and Sonia have put together. Um, this is the last one that was put in. Uh, it's, uh, it's got a, uh, quite a swell feeding up to it. Uh, there's a little bit of water laying there, uh, but they tell them, Talking to uh, Josh, evidently we had enough water there this spring about a month ago that those stainless steel boards were pretty well underwater. So there's a fair amount of water coming off of that field. There is a hill on it and it's all going right into Wagle Creek. Um, the ditch banks all reinforced with stone and we've got these, uh, these little uh, stainless steel platforms to try and make all the water go through the flume. Okay, next we have, okay, so this is, this is the field 
that we had corn on. Um, we, we harvested. Um, we have a pretty good um, system on the combine for recording yield. Uh, so these are 20 inch, 20 uh, foot swaths um, down the field because we're taking 12 rows at 20 inches. Uh, and uh, we reconciled this whole field and uh, it says here, the total yield for 55 acres was 10,829 and a half bushel. Okay. Um, to, and, then, and then we, I reconciled all of that and it was, it was in 25 bushel total. So when, when we were all done and we shipped that, it was 10,851 bushels of grain um, on our, on our pay stub. So that's, that's exactly, so I'm pretty confident on what the combine says, that's what's going on. And that is actually great once you can do that because of these red spots which show basically zero or poor yield, um, they, are all, they are all from water issues. We had some problems with, uh, with a main um, and tree cover. So we've, uh, we've corrected that, but uh, that's, a, that's a great, uh, great uh, result of what's going on. And uh, the next field, which is a, uh, this was the soybean field. Now the soybean field is done in 40 foot swaths because of the 40 foot grain table. Again, water issues along the one, along the edges, tree lines, flood tiles, trees get into, into tiles. So they, they get fixed. And again, this just verifies where the problem is. And again, the yield was uh, within a couple of bushel. Like uh, incredible how well that system is working. And I'll note that to, to, to Eric, as he, he's on here. Um, I, I did reconcile all those numbers and everything worked out. All right, our next. So this, this comes to our, uh, our little skeleton model here. This is all about the water. What the heck is this? Katie, what'd you do to me here? Okay, so again, when everybody says, why do you wanna work on this project? What, are you, what is your goal? And it's pretty simple. It's all about the water. We just so um, I had made this uh, this little guy, and I actually made a bunch of these. And Lauren took a picture of it and identified all the little features as I was describing them to her one day. So th this is this is a fish, and I guess that's what what we're going to end up with is just dead dead uh, inert uh, inert skeletons if we uh, don't do something about the water. Um, the eye on the fish is kind of our watching. We're watching what's going on. Um, the wrenches and stuff represent the mechanical farming practices. And my trademark HD is in the tail. That's, that's basically my idea, my philosophy uh, on what we need to do. So this is, this is our trademark for the uh, whole water quality project for the whole system. And it really complements Pat's uh, graphics. And I think you have that in the next slide. Okay, go ahead. Right there. So Pat, I did when I did see this, uh, this uh, cloud of, uh, of uh, different uh, uh, BMPs and stuff like that, it says, you know, that all falls right in, be in between everything, we could actually put our, our skeleton fish right on top of that. Because if we don't follow some of these uh, cover crops and some uh, data collecting and best management. And the whole idea is uh, we're trying to do the whole farming system utilizing um, the 4R the four strategies program. So we are testing the fields. Um, these fields have been tested more than half the fields that I own because we want to keep a good um, a line on what's going on. Uh, and we, we do everything that the soil test basically asks for. The only thing we don't do variable rate. Uh, if it comes out, if it averages it out at 120 pounds of, of, uh, of MAP and 120 pounds of potash, that's what we get. We are not changing it and putting, you know, six down on one end and 206 on the other because all the fields are treated as units. And if we, we wanna be able to see 
any kind of changes in the uh, in the field. Uh, and so it's uh, again, it's economics. It's uh, but we are following the, the strategies. Uh, and again, soybeans are no-tilled right in the corn stalks. I like to leave corn stalks long, stringy, and just plant right in between that. Uh, and also what we're going to, what we're working on more, we have found that we needed to go to more of a strip till uh, system to uh, plant corn. We did some trials of last year and they're pretty favorable. That's what was done with it in the cornfield. So as we make a slight change, I'm not going to make a big radical change. Uh, we do a couple things a little differently. We will document them. And if we can show a positive change, then we will, uh, you know, publish that, say, look, you know, we strip tilled it, we did this, we put fertilizer in the fall, or we did fertilizer in the spring. Uh, we've already done a couple of trials, and we've come up uh, and quantified uh, one one result. Uh, and again, the jury's still out. Uh, and of course, good old weather, you know, if the weather doesn't cooperate, then uh, it can be uh, it can be quite a nuisance. Uh, we did not strip till anything in the fall last year because it was way too wet. It was just, you know, I, I can't uh, go through a field and pack it down to cement and then try and put a, a, a fertilizer trench in the, in the field for the corn plant to pick up next year because it will be like trying to plant in bricks. So that is, uh, that is the story. That's where we're going from. It's uh, again, it's pretty uh, basic and simple. It's all about the water. It's, we're looking to the water to be the, our index and say, yes, you're doing, you're doing great. No, you're not doing anything or there's only a, a small change or maybe there's no change. Um, again, we're only uh, one small portion on a great big watershed. Uh, that watershed is uh, pretty extensive. Uh, it goes right into the, into the lake. It's got multiple tributaries. But the, the farm that we're working on has one tributary that is solely uh, taking in what the fields give out and then dumping it into the main um, municipal drain, which is part of the Wago Creek watershed. So that's a lot of, lot of information and I probably skipped a few things, but uh, again, uh, that, is, that is the project. That's great. Thank you, Henry. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I've, I haven't been able to keep an eye on the chat. Um, so I'm going to take a peek at that and just see if there's any questions or anything. And I'm going to invite um, some of our other partners who are here from uh, conservation authorities. We've got um, a couple folks from Upper Thames here, Mike Funk and, and Tatiana Lozier. Um, Colin Little is, uh, and Ryan Carla are around from Lower Thames. Uh, Dr. Wen Hong Yang is in the room. Uh, Patrick Candysides is here, and I know Chris Parsons is here as well. Um, so these are all people who are doing uh, similar work in, in other watersheds or in the Weigel Creek watershed. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you have questions about how we do this or how and how, you know, what this means for Henry and, it, you know, does he hate it? Does he love it? Um, you know, <laughs> what our various experiences are, then, uh, you know, you can type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and, uh, and ask a question and I'll, I'll invite uh, our partners as well if they have anything they want to add to, to what we said to feel free to do so. Oh, B sorry, there is, we were saying BMP over and over again, and that means best management practice. Sorry about that. Okay, maybe we just want to talk about some of the, um, some of the things that we've seen this year and what of our challenges have been so far, like we had a big event last week and what was that like, you know, just what it's like getting out there when the weather's a little wild. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so so what it looks like for us as a you know water quality monitoring team. So you know we we are looking ahead at the weather. So we we become uh, you know weather watchers and storm chasers. So we've you know we've got a, alarms and alerts that that go to our email and to our phone to tell us that, hey there's some weather coming. Um, and you know as probably elsewhere, but you know I mean we're most familiar down here in Essex. Um, 
there's very much a microclimate. So you can have, you know, a boatload of rain fall on, on my house that doesn't fall on Lauren's house. And, you know, and then Henry gets something in between because we live in, in very different places within the county. Uh, so really important that we're watching the weather where we're monitoring. So that's why we have a weather station right there. Uh, so that we can see what's going on. So we're looking ahead to see, you know, is it going to rain? And then the that automated equipment, um, we have modems on those automated equipment, so we can call it from our homes, which I just think is never, I'm never not a, a amused by that, that I can set in my- I've been doing it while we've been speaking. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's incredible that, you know, you can dial in to this automated equipment um, and, um, you know, tell it to turn on. And then we, we have it sample every four hours and we just let it go. And we used to, before we had that automated equipment, we were literally like having to leave the office every four hours to go out and take a sample. And inevitably the rain happens on the weekend and that peak flow that we really want to get that happens at midnight on Saturday without fail. So on Christmas you, Eve on Christmas Eve. <laughs> so you, you can't capture that without this automated sampling. So that is a big game changer for us. So you let the equipment do its job and then we log into it after and we pull up the data so that we can see what that hydrograph looks like. What did the stream do? When it when did it come up? When did it come down? And then it overlays the sampling um, on top of that so we can make our selection of our of our bottles. Uh, so, you know, we, we go out, we collect those bottles, uh, they get transferred into the, the lab, the laboratory bottles and then shipped out. Um, to the various labs, we receive the data and then the data gets entered. So it's, it's a lot of steps and, and process and the actual, you know, getting of the water is, even though there's a lot of steps to it, that's the easy part. Measuring how much water is moving, that's the hard part because, you know, you've got your, your water level loggers that might be out there or bubblers or whatever you might be using. And it's very sensitive equipment. Um, it, but it also moves because in these these particular systems for us, they're flashy. So you see, you know, Wygo Creek will be bone dry all summer long. And then it'll, you know, it rains in the fall and when we get our spring freshet and that thing just rips through. And if you don't put your equipment in right, that fast water is going to pull your equipment right out and then see you later. And then you don't have your, your level logger data anymore. And then Lauren um, cries. And then Lauren cries. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, lots of, lots of complications to, um, to the field stuff. Uh, sorry, See, I'm just a question from Mike. Mike Funk says, question for you, Henry, what motivates you to share about your farming mm. practices on the scale and how are you, and how are your practices perceived locally? That's a really good question. Okay. So this, uh, that, the, this particular farm that we're working on, that has probably been, I've been, farming that. Um, my dad actually farmed it in 1955. It's the first year that he farmed that when it was a dairy farm. So it's, it's got some personal history, but the whole principle, I've looked at lots of plot data and small samples and even, you know, the, uh, our local southern crop does uh, yield, uh, little yield uh, comparisons and stuff. That's great. But I really wanted a field scale. I wanted to look at the whole field what's what is going on uh, I know I'm I'm gaining but the fact that I've gotten using uh, I'm using all these uh, brains and scientists that uh, that are out there and they are either quantifying me and say yep it's we're going in the right direction or they're telling me no we're not seeing a change uh, so that's that's the biggest thing I really wanted to have a third person documentation saying yes you are getting you're getting some positive results. Um, you know, we've, we've all preached about uh, cover crops. Uh, yes, I, I like cover crops and uh, I've done a lot of trials in over the last 10 years with a lot of uh, prominent people. I went and locked, looked at a lot of different sites. And uh, some of the people that are on this, uh, this podcast, uh, I've been at, at your place and looked at what you're doing and uh, can see it. But really, how is that going to affect me and uh, what uh, what uh, what can I expect? And a normal procedure: soybeans follow corn, and uh, corn follows wheat. You know, like that. I've got a system set up so I can uh, basically uh, say yes, this is working, or do I need to make a change? So, and, and on a realistic scale. 
I think uh, Mike, to your question, I think what really works locally for Henry is that he never loses sight of the bottom line. He's a farmer. He is, he is, you know, making sure that he has a successful and productive farm while also keeping all of these things in mind, you know, so he's, you know, if something doesn't work or if the, the weather is going to dictate that something changes, then he does that. And he's, he's not doing something totally, you know, mm. outrageous. And, it, you know, I mean, and we didn't maybe accentuate it enough for, you know, folks that aren't from here, this is heavy clay soil. So some of the stuff that works in other places mm. simply doesn't work in Essex. So, mm. you know, we would love to have cover crops all the time, but you, you can't have cover crops all the time here for a variety of reasons, right? It, maybe it doesn't dry out fast enough in the spring. Maybe, you know, maybe a million things happen. So, um, so I think what makes um, what Henry does work locally is, is that it's what other guys are doing and, and gives that example of, you know, and how you can do things a little bit differently. Because as Henry has said, you know, that we do have a lot of continuous soybeans in Essex. So if we can show that, success of crop rotation that's a huge win so so that's mm. something I think is really important um there was a question from Tracy about explaining what a model is and that is a very loaded and giant question but um <laughs> when hung if 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 you can help with that to you know give a a, a quick idea of of where yeah. you know yeah what a model yeah. is okay. Yes, and uh, thank you, Katie, and uh, thank you, Tracy. Would you allow me to share? I think I can share. Okay, perfect. And uh, basically, that and uh, what I put here, and it's a USDA uh, work. And uh, basically, that I'm sorry. And uh, this is uh, basically that the um, USDA has a conservation effect assessment project. And this project started sorry, in two thousand. Sorry, we're not seeing your screen. If you are, if you are sharing okay. something, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's okay. okay. Let me try again. And uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Let me uh, share again and to see if that's. Uh, did, did you there see you that? You yep. See that? Okay. So, what I'm saying that I will be very quick. And basically, that this is the USDA and the Conservation Impact Assessment Project. So, what do they do is that they talk about modeling and how they do is that to extrapolating and fill the results. And like what Katie and uh, Noreen and uh, Henry talk about it. And to a watershed and then to a to a region, so that's pretty much the the, the workflow. And they were there. Uh, don't please don't get into detail. I just want to show you that. And then, for example, and then they have done like um, Great Lakes region and you know, Mississippi and uh, Ohio those those regions. Basically, that's that's what they did. And then they are able to show results about you know with BMP, without BMP, or even future BMP. So that's pretty much. Um, in a nutshell, that what the model about is that we using a model able to, uh, based on the watershed condition, like I say, land use soil and the topography, climate, and then that model is set up a model. But that model, in order to work, we, it's imperative, we need to have the field measurement. So it's specifically in the recent, like I say, 20 years or so, it's about edge of field experiments and a field, because we want to know the source of the water, what the BM, BMP effects are. Like today, what's, um, you know, let's uh, Henry showed the slide from the uh, Katie's group is about the with cover crop and without a cover crop. That's so valuable. So for us to able to calibrate the model, make sure the model is working. After the model is working, and then the model can start to make experiments. Say, okay, if you want to make, you know, Henry's labor, you know, they become a cover crop, mm. whatever the effect looks like, right? You want to tillage what it looks like, even without a cover crop, what it looks like. And then further than that, because we are not able to do field, edge of field experiment everywhere, right? And then we're going to extrapolate this uh, measurement and to the nearby similar watershed. So that's pretty much the approach and what we did in the uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, glass, in the WPBE and also people probably heard about the model called SWAP soil and water assessment tool. And that's what the USDA did. And then now we are doing a separate version and which is more uh, IM webs, which is the more grid version of that. Sorry, and uh, we use this for on-farm projects and uh, for, for other projects as well. And uh, I just want to say that today, and uh, you know, I participated in this meeting is so inspiring and to see that and how the people like Henry and uh, you know, with Katie and, uh, and uh, CA clinics monitoring. And also I saw the government clinics here and uh, some other people here. That's just wonderful. And it's great collaboration. So 
So in short, and uh, <laughs> model has many kinds. Like we, I talk about a model we are working on, but there are some other model, like say, so loss equation and uh, all monthly doing, and uh, like uh, USDA doing the um, ACPF, agriculture policy framework, those type of things. So my assessment is that all models are good and they serve specific purpose. Mm -hmm. For example, soil loss equation and going to identify hard spots on erosion. And the ACPF, again, is trying to identify what's the good location for implementing conservation practices. So the model, what we're working on, and similar to SWOT, and then we're working on SWOT or some other similar models, is trying to use in <laughs> uh, the condition, incorporate all the necessary condition and then field measurement, and to build experiments, and to examine what a different type of uh, the, the uh, conservation effect are. However, and they will have a caution here, and then mode is only as good as data, and of course, as good as the algorithm, right? So what we do is that, and I always say we are data hungry people, and we want to get as many data as much as possible. And also that, and we want to make the mode open, let people know what we're doing, which parameter we use, and what things looks like. So that's pretty much, in you know, another shall I explain and about what model I hope I can explain a little bit better, but uh, if uh, any more questions, I can always uh, talk again with uh, individual clinics. And awesome. uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wenhong. And it is, uh, there's been a couple of um, little summaries as well in the chat, if you wanna take a, a look at that at a sort of high level explanation of what a model is. Um, and there's you know, there's different ways of, of modeling and um, and different things that we model. So it's it's a really 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 great tool. Um, so thank you for that. And I think this is also this is also the good place for for Wen Hong and I to plug the need for longer term data. Um, yeah. You can't you can't build a good model with a year or two worth of data. Yeah. You need yeah. several yeah. years of data to build a model and calibrate it and validate it. And exactly. then you can run it. So this is our, our plug that, you know, we, we started in, in the Weigel watershed with the Glassy program, then we have on farm and we have living lab. So, you know, that, that need to have that continuous um, funding so that we can keep monitoring so that we can build good and useful models to help us really understand uh, how we, what we can change on the landscape and how that can influence our, our water quality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so actually, it's, uh, but I, I look at, thank you, Katie, and then uh, look at the comments and from Bunny, from Pam and the case, case and I, I greatly appreciate all those comments and they look exactly the point. And the model itself, and the, it's, a, it's a useful tool, however, and then I always uh, remember the caution, I get what's, um, and uh, the uh, Keith point out and, and about what's the process over there, what assumption we made. And, uh, but in some way that's, and I would say that that's the way we all work together, right? To get a better product out of it and uh, to get our conservation assessment results more reliable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see, Patrick, do you have anything that you wanna add at all about, uh, about the edge of your old sites that, uh, that you guys have? Uh, yeah, hi, Katie. Um, great presentation, by the way, to you and Lauren. Um, I think you, you kind of touched on it, but I, the, uh, the thing that, the challenge I've always found with this type of work is the year round aspect and trying to collect the data year round. You touched on it with the climate. And, and incidentally, we, we've had some good collaboration, I think, with trying to figure out when we're going to, you know, set up our ISCOs to trip and all that by communicating with between ourselves and also with our, our friends at uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, who also are monitoring for uh, collecting samples as well at our sites. But um, yeah, I mean, we've had some challenges with some of our equipment uh, with uh, the cold temperatures. <laughs> they, they don't like the cold temperatures, right? So that's, <laughs> that's another challenge. But yeah, other, other than humidity, that... humidity, which is hilarious because they sound water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, right. But um, other, other than that, I, I, I think, um, yeah, we're, we're on to something really good here and, and hopefully uh, we can overcome these challenges. For sure. Get and some it, good data. Yeah. And it's true. The collaboration has been really, really awesome. Um, you know, we we got together. There's a ton of people that are working in the Weigel watershed on different projects and not just Living Lab and On Farm. There's also some academic partners uh, doing some additional work. 
and finding that space to bring everybody together and say, you know, what are you doing and how can we, how can we make sure that we're complementing one another and, and not overlapping and, and working together on this stuff. And, and one of the ways that we do that is that we have an email chain that says, Hey, it's going to rain. And, you know, we are physically present in the Essex region. So we can, you know, we can also sort of, you know, so don't worry, it didn't actually rain as much as you think it might have rained. And right. <laughs> you right. know, um, well, okay. yeah. the freezing rain is on its way. Yeah, don't drive anywhere. You're going to slide. <laughs> so. Well, it's, it's funny. Sonia and I have actually been communicating with Josh, like, through this presentation. Mm. He's actually at Henry's right now collecting oh, samples from our ISCO. So. Wait, well, yeah. exactly. and Lauren is well, I was checking our technician. And <laughs> I was sending the bottle. Like, I was sitting here. If you noticed, I was looking down. I wasn't texting. I was literally, well, I was. I was texting our technician. <laughs> right. <laughs> So it, it, it goes on yeah exactly exactly <laughs> it goes on and this is this is moving into the time of year when stuff starts happening and I think um you know when we're talking about whether why it's important that we monitor all year round and we didn't I don't didn't put a slide of this in here mm. but we have some good data from our glassy project and and this is shown over and over again by researchers that most of the phosphorus moves off of land during rain events in the non-growing season. Yeah. So when there's right. nothing on your field and your field is bare and you no get roots. that rain or you get that meal, yeah, you, you got no roots on there, you've got rain, you've got snow melt, whatever's happening, that's when we see most of the loss. And why that's important is that, you know, our, our colleagues in Ohio that work in the Maumee River, where we know, you know, the phosphorus from the Maumee really adds to the harmful algal bloom issue. We know that the phosphorus that comes in the springtime is what feeds the algae. So that's why we really need to get a handle on how much is moving off the fields and through our water courses over the winter months in that early springtime. And it is the hardest time for us because you, you know, your equipment doesn't like to be cold. So you've got to pull it out when it's really cold, make sure you get it back in, in time, you know, your lines can freeze any number of things can happen. Plus it's just, it's cold and you've got to get out there and you've got to do your thing. And so, you know, typically when everybody else is tucking in because it's raining, that's when our teams are mobilizing and, and getting out. Uh, so I'll add it's a particular challenge here in Windsor Essex because we have, um, multiple freeze thaw cycles so you'll yeah. have a day of thaw where there's rain on snow and it's a massive event and the ditches are full but like a couple of hours later it drops back down to like minus 14 minus 15 and then everything freezes in the equipment so you may have been able to sample but then you can't a get into your equipment because all the padlocks and the, every, everything's frozen and then you get into your bottles and then your bottles are frozen and then so even if you're able to get like, these really big events if you want to catch the rising and the falling of that hydrograph it's really tough to get the falling before it freezes so, and and you know, while it's but, still safe to drive <laughs> Yes, and without giving your technicians hypothermia. <laughs> yeah, so lots of, <laughs> but it's you know it keeps us on our toes and it's and it's fun and um, and it's exciting and, and interesting. So, um, does anyone else have any questions for us before at all we, before we, we we wrap this up? Um, and, or any of our other partners, if you want to, if you have any anything else you want to add, you're welcome to do so in the next couple of minutes. Jen, Jen, go for it. Hi, great job, everybody. I've really Thank enjoyed you. this presentation today. Awesome. I'm really, my husband and I have been eating lunch while we're, we're listening to you. And your talk about the free thaw action had me kind of curious. We're, we're in the part of Ontario that I'm in, which is Eastern Ontario. For us, it's typically like one giant thaw, right? right? Mm. So are there going to be living labs, or maybe there are, where that's the more standard norm, um, where you have these big, large amounts of water, or is that something that they're already models for? I'm just kind of curious when we're trying to compare BMPs in different mm -hmm. regions. So that's every watershed that's part of both on-farm and living lab has, it's, you have to create a model for each watershed. So uh, for the on-farm project, that's Wenhong. And for living lab, there's a few different modelers that are working on things. Um, so they would take the data from one watershed and they would make the model just for that watershed. So, um, Living Lab only has Henry's site as an edge of field site just because that's just the way that things worked out. But for on-farm, there are um, sites in the Upper Thames, which is around London and mm -hmm. in Asobel and Maitland. 
and they have, they're in the snow belt. So they've got more of that situation of, of having a big um, snowpack and having the melt. So they will still have multiple melts, but they do have more of the snowpack situation where they mm. get one big melt where like, we never really even have a snow pack to speak of. I mean, we might, you know, get a bit of snow and then it melts and then it snows again. So, yeah. so that's why it is important to monitor different watersheds that behave differently. You know, you've, and you've got different mm. landscapes, different rolling landscapes, different land uses. So, um, and we yeah. know that like, practices are like have to be adapted locally it's what you were saying earlier things that work in Ohio or things that work for the north don't necessarily work on our clay soils and so it does make it's nice that there's labs all over the country and that there's labs all over Ontario so that you have all these you can see what might be a locally adapted practice and what might be more applicable to the entire country so we can kind of start to like tease out because there is plenty of academic information on these mm -hmm. individual things but what we don't have is them in specific places for the specifically for the Canadian context so that's why these living labs are actually so important is because they're doing the research that's being done throughout the world but specifically tailored to our local soils our local climate and our local conditions yeah and Keith has a great comment in the the chat as well about you know just how different things can be around the world and across the continent the continent and I find like a lot of the edge of field work happens in uh, in Ohio so it's it's really important that we have this and there are some other researchers there's uh, you know Mary McRae out of the U University of yeah. Waterloo that's doing some great work on on edge of field stuff as well so there is work that happens outside of these two programs mm. as well absolutely are there any other questions or comments from anybody okay going once going twice <laughs> Seeing none, I'm going to pop up. Katie, um, oh, Ma go ahead. Katie, go ahead just, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment here. Mm -hmm. Is that and uh, this um, uh, question raised by by Jennifer is so important, mm -hmm. and for us mm -hmm. as researchers, and we, I have to say, I struggled for twenty years about how to categorize in snow melting and frozen soil postures. So, and uh, I started our work uh, from Manitoba. And uh, that's the AFC web project. And of course, we were also working in Ontario. They're very different. So in these cases, and based on what you folks and the told us also were, were observed, yes, we have a frozen soil, and the, but the frozen condition could be different. And also that we have a snow uh, pack over there. And the snow pack is also and uh, not even distributed. Like a forest could be higher, valley mm. could be higher, and uh, Conservation utility field could be higher, but other things could be less, right? This is going to cause the effect on the melting. And also that the rain was slow, like you, you talk about right. in our area. Yes. So this is all uh, play the rule of doing that. So and a good thing I can report is that over the previous 20 years or so, we made progress on putting those into the model. And we see the difference about how the model prediction, like what uh, our friend Keith and Reed really talk about it, is that, you know, it's very important and the, the, what's the mode assumption of what things looks like and uh, we gradually improve as well. And, uh, and then, but in that processes, and then we come with data with observation, like what Katie, you talk about it. And then how to do the long-term partnership and to keep going with this monitoring and those go different area, is gonna be very important. Thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you. And that's what we're so lucky to have your experience and, and you know, working with those trying to figure out how you model that stuff because yeah, the, the rain on we didn't even mention really the rain on snow that's our biggest yeah. thing that, and, yeah. it, and it, we've been lucky the last couple of years but it, we have had rain yeah. on snow events yeah. on Christmas more yeah. times than I want to count <laughs> yeah. 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 and you have that's to it. catch those because those are your here those are your biggest events and if you miss exactly. it you've missed something yeah. very important so exactly. Um, exactly. yeah you get a little, you know, yeah, you're just con yeah. Kind of constantly watching the weather. <laughs> I mean, we were out two weeks ago. So just to Katie's point where we had a rain on snow followed by a freezing rain event, but we were out in the freezing rain trying to collect the samples. And what actually happens is the fields and the ditches become one in many places, yeah. especially when they're yeah. low. And so there's yeah. so much water coming off the fields that you can't actually tell where the fields end and the ditches begin. And so if you're mm -hmm. not sampling there, that's when most of, if anybody did a full application of phosphorus or fertilizer, then that yeah. full application is currently just on a one-way trip to Lake Erie and so those are the big events like if we're not capturing those when there's literally half the field in the ditch then that's a big one to miss yeah. <laughs> okay. 
even though those are the hardest ones to get out yeah. on Christmas Day. <laughs> on Christmas Day. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you. While I was uh, sitting on the dining table, I was thinking about Katie Norman, they were probably in the field because I saw they were <laughs> running over there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Henry, do you have any? I just have one comment. Yeah. Like, uh, you have, we have to remember that where we're at here on the uh, in Essex County, we have water on three sides. We have Lake yes. St. Clair to the north, we have the Detroit River, and then Lake Erie to the south. And it was recognized already in the late 40s and the 50s that if we don't pay attention to the water shed, what's going on, that we're going to choke Lake Erie. Lake Erie being a very shallow, mm -hmm. shallow lake. Uh, and not only from Canada, but from the U.S., everybody has to pay attention. And that was, you know, like Henry Ford made that uh, mm. that observation way back, you know, before we started dumping everything into the Detroit River. And, you know, to the point that we could walk across the river, even though it, it was a, a river. That, that's, that's an important, uh, important aspect. And, uh, we, you know, we've got these pictures of these algae blooms and, and stuff like that. A lot of that happens, you know, as a, as a Canadian, yeah, we can appoint to the American counterparts and point to the Maumee watershed, but there's a lot of diversified farming over there, a lot of livestock and, mm -hmm. uh, and the terrain. And gotta remember, Essex County is about as flat as a dinner plate. You know, dinner plates are, are nice and big and they got a little curl at the edge. And those are little curls at the edge. We've made them over the, mm -hmm. over the years by our farming practices. Uh, you know, we actually have a, a pull type grader that we we use to pull the edges of fields back and kind of get them contoured into uh, surface drains. Uh, we, we have to create swells to make uh, things work. And like the swells that we have in our uh, field edge or on farm field, they were made, they were made 40, 50 years ago. And uh, and we've just done a job of trying to maintain them. Every once in a while, we have to clean them out, reshape them, and that's what uh, which makes them efficient. And uh, yep, gotta get gotta get stones, you know, gotta get uh, control the the runoff as best we can. Uh, there, that's it's it's all again very basic. It's all about the water. Mm -hmm. What is the water doing? And when the uh, the center drain of Wago Creek. Uh, gets four inches of rain, it just comes up about five feet and it is a really wide drain and it just, it moves. So like yeah. I, I'd hate to fall in yeah. because you're, go, you're going downstream real quick. Yeah, for sure. And, and to your point too, Henry, about, you know, Essex is, we're a peninsula and we are surrounded by water. Um, so it makes it easy for us to connect to it because and you know but there's lots of other places and that's why we look in in the Thames River and why there's work that happens there because the the you know the agricultural practices that are that are happening in the Thames have an impact on Lake St. Clair, the Chart River, Lake Erie but it's it's not as as visible I think sometimes so but here we are inundated we are surrounded by it uh, so we're very very much aware of it and I will say too, there's a lot of international stuff that mm. uh, that's going on. And because of our location here so close to the U.S., I have the opportunity to sit on a lot of those international committees. So um, just, you know, to alleviate some of, you know, those thoughts that you may be having, like, well, what's happening in the U.S.? A lot, a lot's happening in the U.S., a lot's happening in Canada. There's lots of good conversation that happens between uh, scientists, researchers, government, um, you know, we try to, to pull in the different farm organizations. So we're getting that representation. Um, so lots of, lots of good stuff going on. Um, okay, I'm gonna try this again. Any last comments or questions? Eric, I see you just unmuted yourself. Do you have a question? Yes, Katie, uh, we're in a different part of the world than you. We're in, on Lake Ontario. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the eastern part of the Lake Ontario, we have 1,300 acres, and we are the watershed mm. because we're on a we're on a point of land between the uh, Bay of Quinte and Hay Bay, which of course are both parts of Lake Ontario. We have a hundred foot vertical fall across the farm. Everything that happens here happens to Hay Bay mm. or the Bay of Quinte, depending on which part of the uh, divide you're on, and. Uh, it's just 
we we don't see much of the kind of research you have there. We don't have mm. the problems as severe in the in the uh, in the area, but uh, uh, it's interesting to see what's going on elsewhere. All the problems that people like Henry have created, and uh, <laughs> I happen to know Henry, so I can say that. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, we're we're aware of of what's going on there, and we're aware of what's going on here. Our thirteen hundred and fifty acres are all tile drain. Mm. There are grass waterways and and uh, and dams and surface inlets and diversion berms and mm. to control that water flow uh, as much as you can. And of course, Mother Nature doesn't favor man made controls, right. but. Uh, yeah, it's. I just tuned in because I wanted to see what was going on somewhere else in the world, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Well, that's awesome. Thank Thanks you. for joining us, Eric. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Nice, nice, nice comments, comments, Eric. Uh, <laughs> Got to remember, I've been to your place, so I know exactly what's what's going on, and it is a it is a great place. It's uh, it's well laid out. Uh, oh, cool. But you also have a a twenty year, thirty year head start on me. Mm. Well, thanks for being Henry's inspiration then, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that 20 or 30 years was my uh, learning. Mm -hmm. uh, we farmed conventionally when we first started here 53 years ago. And it's only in the last, uh, well, we've been no-till cover cropping crop rotation uh, for 30 years now, uh, 20 years very consistently. And uh, so uh, it, it took me a while to learn what to do, but uh, fortunately I had enough education that... Uh, uh, and, and enough intelligence, I guess, to figure out that we had to do things differently. And mm. uh, I know Mel Limus asked me once why we do what we do. Uh, mm. It's because we live here and we see the water and we're in the bay is, we're dependent on the bay and so are all the people around us. Uh, it's a, uh, a tourist area and uh, we'd best do the best job possible. But by the same token, we're egg and pullet producers, so we're feeding the world mm -hmm. and we have that responsibility too. Thank you, Eric. You know, I really, you know, I I really was, appreciate that. You know, Eric, I think it was probably 20, 25 years ago that I was, uh, I actually listened to you and you were making comments. And I said to my dad, I says, you know what? If he can do it, we can do it. So, you know, and uh, I don't think we had as many challenges as you do, but you also have, uh, you have uh, poultry manure, which I think is a big asset. And uh, you're one of the first persons that said, why, why bother me? Uh, you know, buying cover crop, we'll just grow some, you know, and that's, uh, that's a, one of the things that we started to do, like, you know, everybody uh, talks about buckwheat, well, you, yeah, you can get some, I don't know where, well, it's pretty simple, just grow some, and if after you plant a bag, you've got two bags, mm -hmm. so, no, thanks, Eric. Right on, uh, Chris, you've got your hand up. Yeah, it was uh, just to, to respond to, to Eric's point about the, the lack of research in the Bay of Quinty. And it, it's not something that I've personally been involved with at all, but I know there has been a uh, qu quite a large amount of at least modeling uh, type research um, done by George Aronditsis and Maria Dietrich at the University of Toronto um, and uh, Agnes Richards uh, at um, Environment and Climate Change Canada as well has been um, Quite instrumental in that. So it's it's uh, I, I don't know about the level of on farm and edge of field research, but at, at least at the watershed scale and the modeling approaches, similar to what Wan Hong is doing, that there, there is there is work that is being done and has been for about the last ten years or so, I guess, in the in the watershed. So if you, if you would uh, be interested in in getting involved. Um, at the edge of field to do similar kind of work in the Bay of Quinty, that those would be the people to, to speak with. And I'd be very happy to put you in, in touch with them if, if you would be interested. Do you know anyone in Hastings County? <laughs> I see in our comments, we have a volunteer from Hastings County. I'm afraid I don't know where Hastings okay. County is, but I'll, I'll have to have a look. Um, <laughs> well, sorry. Dorian, we will uh, we'll find your details and pass them on to um, whoever the CA is in Hastings County if you're interested. If not, just say no, and we'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Um, oh, oh uh, and I see, uh, oh, no, that's somebody who's waiting to come in, and we're just about done, but okay. Uh, 
Oh, perfect. Oh, thank you. Thanks for these remaining comments that are going on. Um, I'm going to pop a quick ending poll up. Um, very easy. Uh, just, I just want to know quickly, did you learn something new today? Um, yes or no, or I was already familiar. Um, and then some, a question for the farmers that are present. Did you feel inspired by what you heard today? And I already heard Wen Hong say he was inspired. So I have a question for researchers too. Did you feel inspired by what you heard today? And you'll notice researchers that there is no opportunity for you to say no. So you just have to tell me which way we inspired you. And uh, that's it for us. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, I looked at our time slot and I thought, oh golly, how are we gonna fill an hour and a half? But here we are, it's been an hour and a half. Um, thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for listening. Thank you to the farmers who are present, who are doing the work, that are doing the real work and are, are you know, pushing us and pushing us forward and, uh, and connecting with us. So mm. um, yeah, so just thanks for being here. I uh, really appreciate it and have a wonderful, wonderful day.